I ask you, please, if you have your Bible with you, to turn it to Hebrews chapter 12. If you were here last Sunday evening, you would be aware at our reading that we read the same passage last Sunday evening, and we concentrated on the three exhortations which you find in verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews 12, which have become very familiar to us. Uh, Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. These three great exhortations about running the Christian race. And their theme is a theme which is by itself in so many ways, one that should occupy us a great deal in our Christian experience. It is the theme of perseverance. Perseverance in the Christian life, perseverance in the Christian race. But these two verses which we read are also an introduction to the rest of the passage which was our reading this evening. And verses 1 to 11 of Hebrews 12 are really concerned with why it is necessary to persevere in the Christian life. Why perseverance is such an essential part of Christian living, why this quality is of such cardinal importance. And the writer acknowledges that there is a great danger that lies before Christian people of all kinds, from all sorts of different background, the danger of growing weary at the end of verse 3, or losing heart. Now, the reason for this emerges from verse 4 onwards. It is that this Christian race is in the first place not simply a short sprint. It is, as I was suggesting to you last week, really the marathon picture of the race. Now, you will know that Marathon is a city in southeastern Greece, which has become famous because of a battle that was fought there. And one of the soldiers from the battle, whose name has gone down in history, he's known as Phidippides, and Phidippides ran from Marathon to find help from the Spartans for the Athenians in order that they might do better in the battle than they were doing. The distance he ran is reputed to be something over a hundred miles. And so the word marathon became used as the word for a long race. And this is the kind of race that uh, the Christian is called on to engage in. The Christian life is like this marathon race. So it is not merely a matter of beginning well. It is not merely a matter of having a spurt so that you make a great impression in early days. It is a matter of going on, enduring to the very end of the journey until you cross the final tape, as it were. Now that, of course, is the situation in which it is very easy to grow weary and lose heart. And the writer is concerned to deal with that particular problem which he sees amongst his Hebrew contemporaries. But the other reason is that this race is obviously not a flat race. It is what we would describe as an obstacle race. There are all kinds of obstacles in the way of running it. And so he speaks in verses 3 and 4 about opposition and about struggling and resisting. Now, that is because the race, by its very nature, is an obstacle race. There are all kinds of obstacles in your way. John Bunyan uh, 
caught the idea of this from the New Testament when he pictures Christian on his pilgrimage in Pilgrim's Progress, meeting all kinds of obstacles on his way to Zion. So he goes through sloughs of despond. He meets opposition in the form of Apollyon, the great arch enemy of those who are engaged in this race, who wants to turn them back. They meet places like Doubting Castle and Hills of Difficulty and so on. Now, these obstacles against which we are set in this Christian race may be all kinds of things. They may be physical obstacles of physical suffering or disablement or difficulty. They may be inward things, trials, particular weaknesses from which we may suffer in our own personality. There may be personal battles with sin which we fight at a particular level. There may be such things as losses of various kinds that we may experience. There may be loneliness. The list is obviously endless. But the key question for the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews is how do we cope with running the Christian race in the light of these obstacles? How can we endure to the end? How may we persevere through difficulties and trials and tribulations of various sorts? Well, this passage in Hebrews 12 from verse 3 onwards gives us the answer. And I want to suggest to you this evening that we might understand it in the shape of a number of words of encouragement which the apostle gives to us. You notice how in verse 5 he identifies a particular word of encouragement that comes from the book of Proverbs. But there are throughout this passage at least four words of encouragement. And they all really concern our attitude, our thinking, our approach, our apprehension of this Christian race, this obstacle race in which we are engaged. And the very first word of encouragement that he speaks is in verse 3, and it is this, and perhaps there is none more significant or valuable than this, keep your thinking Christ-centered. Keep your thinking Christ-centered. Verse 3, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, in all kinds of different ways in Christian living, it is absolutely vital for us to keep our thinking Christ-centered. That saves us from all manner of confusion, doctrinally, for instance. But it saves us quite specifically from growing weary and losing heart and failing to persevere in the Christian race. And he urges us, consider him. There is no question, of course, who the him is. He has just been urging us in verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. But in verse 3, he says, consider him. Now, the word consider is the word from which we get our English word, analogy. And what he is really saying is make an analogy of Jesus. That is, set yourself and your own life and your own experience over against his. It is the idea of comparison. And he wants us to compare our own experience with the experience of Jesus. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. 
Now, let me try to tease out for you a little why our thinking being Christ-centered is so important. There are at least three reasons, and let me give them to you as briefly and clearly as I can. The first is that if we are not Christ-centered in our thinking, in the midst of trials and tribulations and troubles, in the midst of opposition of various kinds, if we are not Christ-centered, we shall be self-centered. The real alternative to considering Him is that we consider only ourselves, that our attention is turned in upon ourselves. Now, in some ways, that's a repetition of what he has just been saying in verse 2, fix your eyes on Jesus, not on the circumstances, not on the troubles, not on the trials, but fix your eyes on Jesus which is one of the most difficult things to do when life is at its most painful, when troubles abound, when opposition to your Christian progress is becoming rampant. The tendency in the midst of all of these things is expressed even by our physical posture. What do you tend to do? Your head tends to slump does it not? And what happens is that you are looking in upon yourself and begin to engage in some self-examination and self-assessment and self-pity even, and all kinds of things that center upon yourself. Now, the writer to the Hebrews says, consider him Let your thinking, your assessment, your comparisons be Christ-centered. That's the first reason it's important. The second is this. If we are not Christ-centered in our thinking about Christian experience, we shall fail to expect the right pattern for Christian living. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you examine, for example, the teaching of Jesus when he is in the upper room telling the disciples what they are likely to experience as he leaves them in the world and commits them to live for him in a hostile society, he invites them to consider him. Jesus does this. This is John 15. If the world hates you, Remember that it hated me before it hated you. The servant is not above his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So Jesus says to his disciples, consider me, consider the pattern of my life, so that you are not misled as to what to expect. You see, that's a very important thing. There are many well-meaning Christians who try to encourage the young Christian, for example, and say, now you need to trust God in your life now begun in Christ, or they may even say to those who are not yet Christ's, and say the answer to all your problems, the panacea for all your ills, is to be found in Jesus. Come to Jesus and He will solve all your problems. Turn your sadness to happiness and so on. You know the sort of thing I mean. Now the great problem is that Jesus didn't ever promise that kind of thing to those who would follow Him. He said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also because the servant is not above his master. If the world hated you, hates you, remember that it hated me before it hated you. Consider me, he says, the pattern of my life. And the author to the Hebrews says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. And What he means us to say is, 
Let my thinking about this so be Christ-centered that I will say, well, of course it happened to Jesus. And if I am following him, then the servant is not above his master. But here's the third thing. If we are not Christ-centered in our thinking, we shall end in despair or in defection because it is by pondering the way that he endured that we ourselves will be able to endure. It is in the knowledge that he has endured this opposition from sinful men and has overcome that opposition not only for his own sake, but for ours. So he says to his disciples in the same part of John's gospel, in the world you will have tribulation. That's going to be your experience in the world. In the world you will have tribulation. But he doesn't just leave it at that. He then says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now, that's the point, you see, of considering Him. We consider Him because we want to avoid merely considering ourselves. We consider Him so that we might get the right pattern of Christian experience burned into our minds and not expect something Jesus doesn't lead us to expect. And we consider Him because He has overcome all the foes that meet us in our Christian experience. So, he says, keep your thinking Christ-centered. Here's the second word of encouragement. Keep your thinking balanced. Look at verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Now, his concern in verse 4 is simply that we must not get our view of our situation out of proportion. And it is so easy to do that, is it not? One of the easiest things in the world when you're facing opposition as a Christian or trial and tribulation as a Christian is to get your thinking out of proportion. And the way to get it balanced, he says, is to notice how others have gone before you and suffered infinitely, infinitely more. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I have little doubt that that's a reference back to the previous chapter and to the paragraph that uh, goes from verse 32 of chapter 11. But at verse 35, details for us some of the absolutely horrific accounts of what had happened to men and women of faith in the Old Testament era. An extraordinary account. Have you read this recently? Listen to verse 35 onwards. Women, this is the kind of thing that was happening to them. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Now, that's not just ancient history. That's the sort of thing that, for example, when I lived down in Ayrshire, people would take me to places where the Covenanters had lived in the 17th century. 
And there they would show me places where a man was taken out for the sake of the cause of Christ, for no other. Not because he had committed a crime, because, but because he was standing for Christ in a Christless generation. And he was taken out in the presence of his wife and little children and summarily beheaded. There were people there who faced death every day. And one of their favorite texts was this that we read this evening. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Now, it is an important thing, you know, when we are suffering inconveniences for the sake of Christ, when we are even experiencing subtle and difficult attacks upon our faith from various people in the world in the way that can be distressing and trying. It is really important to read a passage like this and say, my goodness me, I'm living in a four-star hotel by comparison with these people. I know very little of what real persecution for the name of Christ is. I never walked over these hills in, in Ayrshire and saw the place where John Brown, for example, laid down his life in his farmyard for the sake of Christ without saying to myself, could you really face that kind of thing? What would you be like if you were there? One of my friends who was a minister, I remember, uh, said to me when we passed the place together one day, he said, you know, it puts in a different context altogether, doesn't it? Uh, the difficulties I've been experiencing in my pastorate, not being appreciated dissolves in the presence of this kind of thing, doesn't it? Now, it's a bad thing for a young man especially. It's all right for old codgers like me, but it's a bad thing for a young man not to be appreciated. And no congregation should keep him in that position. But we need to be balanced in our thinking about all kinds of things, do we not, that we are experiencing and going through. And the apostle says... In your struggle against sin, I wonder if this was difficult for them to listen to. Do you think it was? In your struggle against sin, he said, you haven't yet resisted unto blood. Well, he is simply saying to them, keep your thinking Christ-centered. Keep your thinking balanced. Third, keep your thinking biblical. Verse 5, you have forgotten, he says, that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. And then he quotes from Proverbs chapter 11, verses three, uh, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And uh, if you want to find it in uh, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, you'll see that the Hebrew is slightly different from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is used here in Hebrews. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Now, that is the Scripture uh, addressing us and um, dialoguing, that's what the word means, dialoguing with us about our experience. And it is intending to address us and make us think about our experience. Notice in verse 5, he says, you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you. It's a very significant thing that the use of Scripture 
in such a situation is not really primarily as a sedative to dull the ache. It is rather a reasoning with us about the whole of our situation that it may change our view of it. Now, I need to add that there are many occasions when the Word of God does apply itself to our heart and mind to dull aches and to give us, as it were, a pillow on which to rest our head. But one of the vital ways in which God helps us in times of adversity and opposition and difficulty, whatever it may be, is to dialogue with us, that is, to reason with us about our situation so that we may view it and think about it differently. And you will see how he does this from Proverbs chapter 3, which he quotes in verses 5 and 6. There are one or two things that the apostle is drawing out from uh, these verses in Proverbs 3. The first is this, that all God's dealings with us who are his redeemed people have to be seen in the light of his fatherly love. Notice verse 5. You have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Now, the Hebrew version of that in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, emphasizes even more the whole idea of the fatherhood of God, which is central in all the discipline he brings to bear on our lives. If you notice from verse uh, 5 onwards, you will find that the word discipline occurs ten times down to verse 11. Ten times over, he takes up this word discipline, and it's all the time related to a father's relationship to his child. And what he is saying is, all of the trials, all of the pains, every obstacle that you meet is in some sense part of the disciplining work of God as a heavenly father. He is taking trouble with you. That's the point. Because he has a design to do something of profound importance in your life. And he goes on to compare that to a human father's discipline in verses 9 and 10. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits, that is, our spiritual heavenly Father, and live? Now you see the parallel. He says, how am I to think about these trials and difficulties? How am I to face the many pains, even the profound anguish that appears to be allowed to come into my life as I am seeking to run this Christian race? Well, he says, you are to understand it, first of all, within the context of God's perfect fatherhood. Now, that may be seen in some senses in relation to the human fatherhood that we have known. Why is it that a human father, who is a good father, would deal with us in a way that would perhaps discipline us, deprive us of things, even inflict pain upon us at certain times. Why would he do it? Well, it is, of course, true that some fathers do it because they enjoy it. 
and they are sick and need to be attended to and restrained. But the good father thinks, says Jesus, when he is comparing heavenly, the heavenly father with the earthly father, think of the good father. You will realize that he disciplines his children because he is not prepared to let them do whatever they like. He has some interest in them. He has a concern for them. He wants to make them something other than they would become in a situation of anarchy. And so he disciplines them. He restrains them. He guides their lives. And there are many occasions when he may deprive them of things that they, in their lack of wisdom, would imagine would just be the answer to everything that a youngster wanted. And he will deprive them of it. And restraining them from certain actions which he knows are going to hurt them, ultimately, may well cause them profound anguish and disappointment. But the simple fact is that his concern for them and his willingness to spend time and energy, physical and emotional and nervous, in dealing with them is not an evidence that he doesn't love them. It's the sign that he does. Now, if you can multiply that by infinity and baptize it into Christ, you will see that God's perfect fatherhood is being described to us here as the fatherhood of one who disciplines us for our benefit and profit in order that he might bring forth in our lives something that could be produced no other way. That's what the writer of the epistle is saying. Now, there are two ways that people can react to God's disciplines. In the midst of situations in life that are painful, difficult, obstacles as we would think and we want them out of the way, there are two ways in which we may react. One is to make light of them. Verse 5, when he begins to quote from Proverbs, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. That is, he does not take them seriously. And it's possible to do that, to dismiss what God is doing in your life when it is unpleasant or unacceptable, and to try to shake it off, as it were. And the apostle says, you need to be a willing scholar in God's school and not make light of the Lord's disciplining. The other possible reaction is to lose heart. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Now, the reason we would not make light or lose heart is that if we know God as the perfect Father He is, we will know that unlike earthly fathers, He never, ever makes mistakes. He never, ever lacks wisdom. He never, ever lacks the resources to do what he plans to do in the lives of his children. And therefore, we must trust him. That's what he is saying. Don't make light of it. Don't lose heart because of it for the simple reason that God knows what he is doing. So keep your thinking Christ-centered, keep your thinking balanced, keep your thinking biblically informed. And that's one of the really important reasons 
why our familiarity with Holy Scripture is so important. I just wonder if perhaps there is a slight hint in what the writer is saying to the Hebrew Christians in uh, verse 5. You have forgotten that word of encouragement. Now, it's just possible that they didn't ever know it. It's just possible that they had never really allowed it to sink in to their heart and conscience. But this is the time when you greatly need a biblically informed mind. Here's the last thing, and it's this. Keep your thinking Christ-centered. Keep your thinking balanced. Keep your thinking biblical. And the last thing is keep your thinking long-term rather than short-term. Look at verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And the principle is keep your thinking long term rather than short term. Now, short term thinking is a great plague in almost every area of life. It is certainly a great plague in the Christian life where it's so easy for people to take a short-term view rather than a long-term view. There are people who make short-term decisions and never think about the long-term consequences of these decisions. And here, as in many places, Scripture pleads with us to have a long-term view of life and of God's work in our lives and of our present circumstances. You notice the two phrases in verse 11, at the time and then later on. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. Now, what the apostle is concerned with is what God is concerned with. And God is concerned with the long-term prospects in the lives of his children. The trouble is, we are mostly concerned with the short term. And the age in which we live has multiplied that danger to us, you know. The sort of atmosphere in which we live today is all for the short term. You know, you regularly get uh, advertisements, for example, for credit cards which have the legend, such and such a card takes the waiting out of wanting. See? You can get it now. You don't need to take the long-term view. You just need to present the card and get it now. The long-term view is you may well get into the most atrocious debt. But short-term thinking says, get it now. Why wait? There are so many areas of life where that pressure is put upon us in our generation. And it has crept in to our Christian way of thinking and acting and living. And the tendency so readily is that we are the now generation and we are not thinking about the then. But Scripture is full of this. 
It uses so many illustrations to teach it to us, like the illustration of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow now, you will reap then. That law is never, ever broken and proved wrong. God is not mocked, says the apostle. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. So it's the long term. Now, it's that very metaphor that you will notice the apostle uses. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness. Now, do you see how it is important, therefore, to keep our thinking long term? Isn't this precisely what Jesus does when we hear of him enduring the cross and scorning its shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God because he had the joy that was set before him in view the long term? Now, that's so important, of course, isn't it? And even you and I know that it's important in bringing up children, if you bring up children. No sensible parent is going to say, well now, the child is screaming. For the sake of present quiet, we will give them exactly what they want. And we will go on doing that for a prolonged period of time. We are living in the present. Give him what he wants. It will stop him screaming. And that's all we want. We want peace for the time being. Now, no sensible parent does that. Any sensible parent says to himself or herself, what's going to happen if I constantly do that sort of thing is that this child is going to grow up with the most massive problems. And I am determined here to create wise, good, and godly character. And so I'm going to take the time and the trouble and, if necessary, face the pain of dealing in a different way with this child. You might think I was an expert in bringing up children. I I deny the idea, but I know the analogy, and I see it in God my Father whose great concern, my dear friends, is not simply to keep us happy for the time being, but to make us holy in the long term. He is out to produce character. He is concerned with a harvest of righteousness, and whatever it may take to produce it, He will sow it in our lives. And this is how we are to run the race that is set before us, with our thinking geared to the long term. Keep your thinking Christ-centered. Keep your thinking balanced as you see what God has done in the lives of others before you and around you. Keep your thinking biblical, that it may be controlled by the doctrine of God's perfect fatherhood. And keep your thinking long term, that is, live for eternity. And you will discover that my Father's hand has never caused his child, a needless tear. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you so much ashamed of the way we have failed to trust you, so conscious that we have often made light of your disciplines and refused to be exercised by them. In your great mercy, 
Help us that our lives may be Christ-centered, balanced, biblical, and lived for eternity, that you may have a harvest of righteousness from them in the day when we appear before you. We ask it for your great name's sake. Amen.